Well, welcome to the CAF Warbird 2 webinar, a show where we talk about warbirds, about history, about flying, World War II, anything uh, related to that. That's what we uh, like to cover here on uh, Warbird Tube. It is supported by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest uh, flying museum. If you would like to support this uh, nonprofit organization that has more than 12,000 members worldwide, we invite you to uh, drop in on the website, commemorativeairforce.org, and you can help us uh, support the education uh, inspiration and honor through uh, flight and living history experiences. That's the uh, mission of the CAF. We'll, uh, we'll take donations, memberships, or just uh, volunteering your time and talent to help keep these wonderful airplanes uh, in the air. And we're going to talk about one of those uh, aircraft tonight, the P-51 Gunfighter, one of my favorite aircraft, the P-51, and uh, one of my favorite people, Larry Lumpkin. We're introduce Larry in just a moment and uh, but if you don't know me I'm Steve Bush your host for tonight I'd like to welcome everyone who's watching on uh, Facebook welcome to those of you on YouTube and of course those who are watching on GoToMeeting now if you'd uh, just take a second out of uh, your busy day as we're we're getting uh, ready to get going here and hit the like share or subscribe or follow us button we'd appreciate that because that uh, helps to, uh, to keep these things going and to keep you informed of the next time uh, we go live with a, a program like this so with uh, no further ado, we'd like to uh, introduce Larry Lumpkin, who is, uh, the, I will call him the caretaker of the P-51 Mustang gunfighter. Uh, Larry's joining us from uh, sunny, warm Florida. Good to have you here, Larry. Good to see you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, as uh, we start talking about the P-51 Mustang and specifically Gunfighter, folks, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat box on, on whatever platform you're on, and uh, we'll try to uh, answer the questions as uh, we go along this evening. So, uh, Larry, first of all, tell us a little bit about you and how you got involved in aviation. Well, um, I had been uh, interested in aviation since I was a, a young child. And most of my inspiration came from watching crop dusters in Southeast Arkansas. That's where I grew up. Um, my folks didn't have much money and my, my mother would not support me going out and getting involved with the airplanes. And I was, and I was wanting to go out and do nothing but uh, help out with the crop dusters. And she was afraid I was going to jump in one of them and go flying with them. Uh, so anyway, long story short, I didn't get started until after I got out of the Air Force and moved to Omaha, and I learned to fly right there at uh, Epley Airfield in Omaha. Um, I got my private certificate in about two months. I was a little bit motivated, and uh, by uh, June of the following year, I had my CFI, my instrument and commercial. So I went to work a couple, almost three years as a CFI, and then flew corporate uh, until I got hired at United Airlines in 1986 and flew there for uh, 32 years and retired three years ago. And I got involved with the uh, the Warbirds, well, actually the CAF in 1994. And that's how I got involved in this operation. Well, it, it's interesting that uh, you came out of the Air Force uh, and not as a pilot. So I, I didn't know that about you. What, what did you do when you were uh, in the Air Force? I was a electronics uh, head. I worked in research and development missile guidance system out at the test track at uh, White Sands Missile Range. All right, and uh, what are the some of the aircraft that you flew uh, uh, in your uh, commercial aviation endeavors? Well, let's see, my first uh, corporate job was uh, a co-captain on a Mitsubishi MU-2. I, Flew that, they call it the rice rocket. Uh, great airplane once you got it above 200 knots, uh, but a uh, really good airplane. And uh, flew that for about a year, and the company sold the airplane. So I went and worked for the beach dealer there, and I flew all the King Airs there and helped work in the sales department. Um, and when they were selling out their business, I went to work for a company down in Harlingen, Texas, that was um, founded by some guys from Omaha, and they had a Cessna Citation. That was my first jet, just a little small jet. Uh, flew that for about two and a half years till they sold their airplane. Moved back to Omaha, uh, flew uh, King Airs and Sabre Liners until I got hired at United. Now, when you were down in Harlingen, was that still during the period that uh, CAF was was in Harlingen as well? 
Yes, and I don't mean to put out negative press, but <laughs> frankly, I walked around in that place and no one would say hello or even speak to me. It was sad yeah. looking back. Uh, it was kind of the culture at the time, and I can say, thank God the culture has changed 180 degrees from that day. That is good. That is uh, something that I know uh, CAF has, has uh, tried to instill in members and, and uh, units that uh, you never know who's going to come through the door, and uh, whether that person is just uh, someone interested in learning more about aviation or a well-seasoned veteran, you just never know until you, you say hi and strike up a conversation. Absolutely. So uh, when, when you were with uh, United, what uh, what did you fly there? Uh, I finished up on the Airbus A320, but I engineered the 727, the DC-10, flew co-pilot on the 737, the 757, 767, and then I went to the Airbus, or correction, I went to the 737 as captain, and then Airbus as captain. I finished up on the Airbus. I I wanted to fly the Mustang on the weekend, so I stayed senior on a smaller airplane, and uh, I flew it for 23 years. So it became just like another glove to wear. There you go. I, I would think it, that uh, if we set the Mustang aside, was was the Airbus then your favorite uh, uh, commercial aircraft to fly? Absolutely not. Uh, no? <laughs> it was close, but the 757 Boeing is a pilot's airplane. Okay. I mean, it's it's got performance. It it takes off good. It stops good. Um, it's just a great airplane. But the Airbus is by far the second. Okay. Well, let's let's get into the meat of of uh, tonight's the topic, and that is the uh, P fifty one Mustang. So we'll take you back to nineteen forty and and World War two. This is uh, the XP fifty one Mustang. And uh, Larry, give us maybe your your sort of brief. Uh, history of, of the uh, airplane during World War II? Well, first off, we I think we should talk about how it came about. Uh, the uh, British came over to the, uh, uh, to Dutch Kimmelberger at North American Aviation and said, hey, we need you to build some Curtis P-40s for us. And uh, because Curtis could not keep up with the demand that they had. And um, Dutch Kindleberger, the president, says, hey, you know, we don't want to build P-40s. We want to build a new fighter for you. And he says, well, you know, they looked at that with a jaundice eye. says, you never built a, a, a fighter before, you know. And um, he says, yeah, but we can deliver. So what what the, the British purchasing agency insisted on was, hey, you got to look at this new fighter that Curtis Wright is working on. I think it's the XP-46. I forget what the number was. But anyway, they had one in development and already a prototype. So uh, some of the guys went to New York, talked about this for about four months. And in May, uh, they signed a contract for the new Mustang. And 120 days later, they had a prototype sitting on the ramp. And uh, the rest is history. Uh, it originally had the Allison engine, mm -hmm. and they f figured out that it was quite a bit restricted because of the altitude performance for fighting. Uh, it was originally designed uh, as a, you know, air-to-ground uh, support machine, but uh, the guy over there flying in England for Rolls Royce, and to me, he's one of the He's one of the heroes of the war because his name is Ronald Harker. He's the test pilot for Rolls Royce, and he's out flying this uh, uh, Mustang around. And he comes back and he says, "Hey guys, we need to put a Merlin in this thing." And everybody was reluctant. He says, "No, no, no." He says, "I'm telling you, if you marry a Merlin to this airframe, you're going to have a beast." And therein was the rest of the story. So. And as we're looking at uh, these two Mustangs, these are the early model Mustangs, um, uh, still with the uh, Allison engine, and then, of course, uh, more famously, the uh, the D model with the uh, bubble canopy, which uh, has the uh, Rolls Royce. Yep. Uh, one of the biggest questions, I say biggest, the most frequently asked question was, 
what kind of engine's in that airplane? <laughs> I said, it's the Rolls Royce. And uh, and you, you can't believe how many people ask if that's the Allison in that airplane. And um, I have to remember what uh, Reggie told me way back that Bob Hoover would always say when he gets asked a question a million times over and over and over. He says, Bob Hoover would just be the most humble, sweet man that he really was and say, well, that's a good question and answer the question. <laughs> of course, the uh, the Mustang had a, a very impressive uh, combat record in the, uh, I guess, the, the second half of, of World War II with the high altitude uh, capabilities and, and also being able to escort bombers all the way into uh, Germany and back. That was the, the first airplane that was able to do that successfully. Uh, also uh, served in the Pacific. Um, and if you uh, want to get into a really good debate around a campfire sometime at an air show, uh, just try and describe which one is the best fighter. And uh, if you'll, you got the uh, Army Air Corps guys are going to say the Mustang. Of course, the uh, Navy guys are probably going to go to the Corsair, and the, the British will go to the Spitfire. But it's uh, it's always interesting conversation. Yeah, one of one of the 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 major things that the Mustang shined and helped us win the war was the long range. Um, they could get the airplane way up to altitude with the Merlin two-stage, two-speed supercharger and get back to just sipping gas. That way they could go all the way to Germany, fight, and come back. That is where it excelled above every fighter in the war. And besides that, it was a, a great flying, performing airplane as far as fighting as well. Now, of course, in, in your experience uh, flying the airplane, no one's really chasing you, uh, although I'm, you've, I'm sure you've done some mock dog fights and, and things, but uh, what is, you know, it, it is, describe how it is to, to fly that airplane in, in even a simulated combat uh, environment. Um, well, the only airplane that I have mock dog fought, fought with was uh, a T-6 painted like a zero and it's a very fun routine to fly with this airplane you have to be real careful because he can only go about 150 knots and you're on the lower end of the spectrum with the Mustang and you can't be just yanking and banking too hard you have to be real careful and I'm sure I know those guys when they were when they were fighting they had to watch all of that you know, because they were doing high-speed stuff and slow-speed stuff, and the guys that could could combine the the high-energy and the low-energy state and use it to their advantage was the one that's going to win. And uh, of course, one of the uh, most famous uh, P-51 pilots uh, who remarkably is still around, just celebrated his 100th birthday, uh, Colonel Bud Anderson, uh, looking at, at a couple of the uh, aircraft that he flew. Uh, Old Crow was was his mount. Um, explain to us as we look at the, the top picture there, that's, that's an unusual canopy on, the, uh, on that Mustang, isn't it? Yes, it's called the Malcolm Hood. And it's, it, if you notice in the, the, the B's and C's, they kind of have a, uh, a birdcage type canopy. Well, they they had a little bit of an answer to that with this Malcolm Hood, where they could see so much better, and um, and that's you know as as we all know the D model really with the the large bubble canopy really made that possible to see very good, but that was a strict advantage when they were able to put that Malcolm Hood on it. And as we look at the, the two aircraft here, it looks uh, like the, I guess the turtle deck, uh, the area between the the back of the cockpit and the and the tail is it's much mm -hmm. higher on this this particular model, which would be uh, assuming a, a B or a C uh, compared to the D. Is was I think that that's B right there? And then on the on the D, it's much much lower. Correct, correct. Um, actually, the the turtle deck airplane, like the the red tail. It's a little bit faster. You got a little bit more drag on on the uh, on the, the later model, but the visibility is is well worth every bit of it. The the, the sacrifice a few knots of speed. And you've uh, you've met Bud Anderson through the years. I have indeed. In fact, I just uh, 
I saw him a couple of years back at uh, the Tribute. I flew in the Tribute at uh, Oshkosh to Bud Anderson. I had the privilege of meeting him and uh, had him sign my uh, my uh, box that we all got presented when we participated in that. And he's just a real honest, to goodness guy down to earth. You can sit and talk to him just like you and I talk right now. Yeah. I also met him over at uh, Arsenal Democracy in uh, 2015. He spoke to us there. So I've met him on occasion three or four times. Great yeah, guy. Just, he's a, he's a, like you say, a very down to earth, uh, uh, very humble. Uh, he, was you know not only World War II but he was in the Air Force up through the early 1970s. Uh, yeah. If you're looking for a good uh, book to fly and fight, is his book is uh, sort of autobiography. It's uh, it's a very good read and I certainly recommend it. Yeah, it's a great book. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, your favorite airplane, and that would be the uh, P-51 that uh, we know as Gunfighter. What uh, what's the history on on this particular airframe? Uh, this airplane was uh, manufactured late in the war. It came off the line in March of 45. It was built in Inglewood uh, plant out in California. And after it was uh, test flown, it was flown over to Newark, New Jersey and put on a ship there and shipped over to Warmington, England. And it's going uh, assigned to the Mighty Eighth and was going to you know, fly out of there. Well, by the time, excuse me, they got the airplane there and was preparing it for battle, everything was over. So it did not see battle. And it sat there for a while, not very long, which surprises me how quickly they got it back across the ocean into the, the, uh, the depot there at Newark. But it sat there uh, in Newark for a couple years and eventually got assigned to... Uh, I think it's Olmstead, Olmstead Field, just around Pittsburgh area. And then it started going to various uh, guard units at that time. And it's been the Kentucky Guard Unit. It was in Chicago uh, O'Hare before it was the big airport. It was there. Um, it was in Cheyenne a lot of its time in the Guard, Cheyenne, Wyoming. And it went down to uh, the New Mexico Guard. And it was surplused in 57. And various owners, and I don't, I do not know all the owners that owned it, you know, during the uh, the civilian part of it. I do know that there was some gentlemen in uh, New Mexico uh, CAF wing down there uh, that were together and owned it together uh, before the CAF acquired it. And um, that's when uh, General Urschler got involved with helping to acquire the airplane and donate it to the CAF, and that was in 1977, and we've had it ever since. Well, Ed, let's talk a little bit about Reg Urschler, who uh, uh, a lot of folks who have seen Gunfighter through the years recognize the name, and, and we've had some questions already asking, uh, you know, uh, about him and, and uh, how he's doing these days. He's doing, he's doing well. He's, uh, in fact, uh, I just saw an email from him today. Uh, in fine form, you know, he's he's still he's still full of uh, great, quite frankly, piss and vinegar, as we'd all say. But uh, he's he's uh, he's doing well. Um, he retired from flying the airplane in 07, and that's when he passed it on to me to uh, to manage it. Uh, he flew the airplane 30 years, and uh, from 77 to 07. And um, he flew with the Heritage Flight, uh, the original Heritage Flight program. And I don't know how many years, but several. And uh, he was one of the original members of that, of that team. Um, he self-supported the airplane, self-flew it by himself, so sponsored it for all those years until he brought me on in uh, 03. I soloed it in May of 03. Um, and to say uh, Reg is a colorful character, that would be an understatement of the day. But uh, I think we all know that most people who know Reggie know what I mean in all due respect. So, Excellent. Uh, where did the name Gunfighter come from? That I'm not 100% sure, but I think a gentleman that owned it 
um, or had uh, part ownership in it was in the, the guard unit down at Kelly and they're known as the gunfighters. And I think that's where it come from, but I cannot 100% confirm that. So that would have been before it, it became part of the CAF. It definitely was a gunfighter before it came part of the CAF. Okay. And it is uh, probably, without a doubt, one of the most recognizable uh, Mustangs on the airshow circuit, uh, having been around uh, so long. Um, it, have you had an opportunity to fly any of the other Mustangs that are in the, the CAF fleet? Yes, I've had the privilege of flying uh, Red Tail. I have not flown uh, Red Nose. And uh, can you compare the two? Because the uh, Red Tail is the, the earlier the uh, C model, right? Uh, yes. Compared to the D. I would say the, the, the biggest thing is the visibility. Um, it, it's definitely different. You set in it differently. You set it at a different height. You can't adjust the seat as well as you can in the D model. And it's classic when I get back in that red tail, what little I get to fly it. You know, I'm, I'm used to sticking my head out, looking, you know, side to side, look around the front, and I'm, I'm cl clanking my head against the canopy and <laughs> just naturally doing that, you know. But uh, you really have to watch your S taxi in an airplane more than anything. Once you get it in the air, the airplane flies much the same. I mean, the engine operates the same. There's a few system differences, but it's really a great, great flying airplane. Of course, this is the the portion of the uh, of the broadcast that uh, you have two choices. You can continue to watch uh, Larry and I talk and and uh, on the on the screen, or you can just watch all these wonderful pictures of, of gunfighter that are going to go by. And and as you do, uh, please recognize the uh, the wonderful photographers who have uh, shared their photos with us. We really appreciate that. Uh, and and as you see their names go by, if you you recognize them, uh, if you know, if you're friends on Facebook or something, uh, especially like Kevin Hong, just tell him you, you saw the uh, you saw some of his pictures on this on this webinar tonight. Uh, Larry, uh, did you fly any uh, Warbirds before you you, you sold it? You said you sold the Mustang in in 2003. What did you fly before that? I, uh, in order to qualify for the Mustang, I had to get a couple hundred hours of T6 time, and that's that's what I uh, cut my Warbird teeth on, if you will. Um, I had a friend of Reggie's, real close friend of his, check me out uh, in the T6. His name is Frank Strickler, and I, I'm i forever indebted to his training on that initial checkout because he really worked me hard, but he gave me one hell of a good checkout. Um, and he had me flying the airplane from the back seat in 25 knot crosswinds. You know, we, we worked hard for a full week almost in Indianapolis getting that done. Um, but that was that was my major warbird uh, uh, prep, if you will, for the Mustang. Did you own a T6? Uh, I did didn't at the time. I do now. Four of us own it together. Okay. And, uh, we've owned it now for almost. Uh, see, I'm thinking eight years now. So I don't get to fly it enough. I'm too busy flying a, a Mustang. But that's tough duty, huh? I'm yeah, sure really. That, no one's going to feel sorry for me there, right? I'm afraid not, Larry. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do I fly the T6 or the Mustang today? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> T6 it, and the Texans, right? That's right. It, and this is a conversation that that uh, you and Leah and I kind of had before, uh, and that is it, the question always comes up: is how does one become a, a Mustang pilot? Uh, and it, it is it is a process. I mean, there's there's a lot that goes into it. It is, but I can honestly say that if you're determined and you have, number one, a good attitude, a good work ethic, and, you know, good pilot skills and aeronautical decision making, you can eventually do it. I mean, you you make your, your, your opportunities come, and I was just so fortunate that the airplane was there where I was at in Omaha. And I got involved in being a grunt for years. I washed on the airplane and I helped work on it and did a lot of the wing work, you know, for the, the Great Plains wing before I even was asked to even think about flying the airplane. And, uh, I, you know, being the right time, or right place, the right time, you got to make your, your, your luck because you got to be prepared when the, the time comes along. 
and there's there's still a group uh, that that helps you uh, maintain the air, airplane uh, there in Nebraska. Yes, and I I really I cannot even go beyond mentioning what it means that one individual in particular, his name is Jerry Mason, has worked on this airframe over 40 years. He's been with Reggie for years, and he's stuck with me. And he's like the rest of us. He's getting in age, but he he loves that airplane, and that is his life. And a lot of us just say, "Hey, we're going to ask permission if we can go fly Jerry's airplane." You know, uh, he he knows that airplane backwards and forwards, and he'll grumble and you know, <laughs> but it's always ready to go. And uh, we've got a, a, you know other volunteers that help a lot. But uh, Jerry's our mainstay guy, and and I help wrench on it as well. Uh, do you have an, an A and P yourself? I do not. I'm just a grade A grunt. <laughs> there you go. And that, that's an important uh, thing to bring up too uh, with the CAF is uh, the pilots do get the glory of flying the airplanes, but there really is there's a role for for a lot of people in there, and, and especially uh, mechanics working on these these older engines. It's uh, it's almost becoming a lost art, but uh, one just like flying an airplane that you can learn uh, from someone like Jerry who can pass along their their knowledge. Yep. And what what happens sometimes is guys get so set in their ways of doing something a certain way and Jerry will admit he does that, but he'll turn right around and, and teach a new guy and have, you know, the patience of Job. Now you can't do this. You've got to do this this way because this will do this and this and this. And, you know, this is not healthy, but this is. It's all good. Uh, and do you know how many hours are on the airframe? Uh, in the yes. almost in the it's, 80 years uh, it's been around almost yeah it's 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 between it's right at uh, 6800 somewhere around there and uh, I'm, I'm 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 pulling the figure out of my head because I don't remember the exact tack time and, and total time but it's right around 6800 hours and in that time uh, you know the airplane looks gorgeous always has but has there been a lot of extensive restoration work done on it through the years um yes it was completely restored in 81 after an accident okay and um uh it has been continually you know i would say back channel re restored as jerry just continually fixes things over and over and over and uh you know he, he calls the guys that did the uh the restoration the restorers the professionals and he'll find something that they did, and it, he just says, "I got to fix this. The restorers didn't do this right, you know." <laughs> but uh, uh, it's it's been well well maintained. And I would imagine with the, the number of Mustangs that are are still flying today, that the parts are not as much of an issue as they are with some of the the more uh, rare warbirds. I mean, I, I certainly understand that you can't just go to uh, Walmart and pick P fifty one parts off the shelf, but uh, they're they're still out there. They they are. Uh, it's just a matter of price, and it's becoming, you know, that and insurance are, are becoming our our biggest Achilles heel. Uh, the price of insurance and the price of parts. Uh, we have some very very dedicated people in, in the industry that want to keep these airplanes flying, but they have costs, you know, just to 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 fabricate a part, you know, just from a blueprint anymore. And, and the good thing is, is they're getting into this uh, this 3D printing to print parts, and that's that's going to be a lifesaver for a lot of parts, honestly. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the stuff is available. It's just a matter of paying for it. Yeah, which which brings us to you know some of the questions that that folks have submitted uh, prior to our our show tonight. Uh, about how much does it cost to uh, fly the airplane for an hour, fuel and and oil and uh, um, whatever associated costs if you know and the way i always answer this is that we have a lot of guys that volunteer a lot of labor including myself um i obviously when jerry's doing a full 100 100 hour in or in an annual inspection i force him to take money <laughs> i said i'm not gonna let you do this for nothing 
but uh, honestly, if you, if you were paying for it out of your pocket, I would assume today it would be $2,500 an hour, easy. Uh, I figure our costs are right at 2000 an hour. Uh, but um, that's, that's pretty expensive. And that's about where it's at. And with that, uh, about what is what do you calculate for a fuel burn for an hour? Like, um, like air show, let's, let's put air show flying on, on one side and then uh, living yeah. history flights on the other. Yeah. Um, let's yeah, let's put put in a third round uh, cruising cross country. We cruise at about 250 knots and we burn about 68 gallons an hour. Okay, if we go do a ride. We and we figure uh, a ride in flight is about a standard ride is about 20 minutes in flight. Uh, if we average 20 minutes, we're going to burn about 25 gallons, probably somewhere in the neighborhood. Now, if the tower delays it, sends you around, holds you, now there goes your cost right straight up through the roof fuel. Uh, but that's the average, and, and we, we work that pretty close. Uh, if you're doing an air show, you're going all out pretty, but you're going for a short amount of time. You're only going for about 10, 15 minutes, uh, but you'll burn, you know, you'll burn about uh, 30 gallons sometimes, you know, depending on how much you mess around and get, get held, you know. Now, if you're flying for uh, Ralph and uh, his son, uh, you may burn a lot of gas, but the, thank goodness the air, air show is buying a gas. <laughs> <laughs> And we're talking about Russell and yeah. uh, Ralph yeah, Royce, uh, two yeah. of the longtime CAF air bosses, and they're well known on the on the air show circuit. My favorite, quite frankly. There you go. Uh, as we're talking, and kind of segued into the into the ride flights, that uh, the living history experience that's been uh, a way to keep these uh, not only the Mustang but a lot of the other aircraft uh, in the air being able to generate their own income aside from air shows because uh, air show income isn't isn't always always there depending on on the size of the show. Um, what modifications were made to the airplane to allow uh, someone to sit in the back seat? And it, it, we're looking at the picture we're looking at right here is. Um, you can see there's uh, obviously an air show shot. So we've got you up front flying and then in the back, you can see there's there's a space for, for someone to sit. So what, what came out? If you look at that, if you look at that picture and you look at the aft part of the canopy, you'll see a red dot. That used to be a, uh, and that's just, just a, a fuel cap that's just, just there. Uh, that used to go into a fuselage tank that was right back there and right Right above that was a huge rack of old uh, vacuum tube radios, and a lot of them heavy. So that occupied all of that space back there. And it was an 85-gallon tank um, and all the radios. So and they pull all that out. We've got modern-day solid-state uh, radios that's up front, and they put in a, a, a jump seat. and um, and our particular uh, seat, I think, is a modified T6 seat that's that's bolted to the uh, the airframe, and of course um, got the the hooker harness seat belts in it and communication set up for the back. And even though I mean we're we're looking at a shot, there's there's someone uh, in the back seat. It's it's really not that roomy back there. Well, you know, it looks that way, but. Honestly, we get some pretty big people in there, and they're they say, I can't believe how big it is, because you sit down further into the airplane back okay. there than you think you do. Uh, the trick is getting a big man in there and out. Um, but seriously, if if they're agile, it's really not a big deal. It's not a big deal. We have. <laughs> I can remember Reg saying that they uh, they put. Uh, such a big man in there. He was a big supporter of the airplane, donor to the airplane. They took the canopy off so he could get in and out real easy. Uh, but and which is not a big deal. It's 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 a real quick disconnect and snap it back into the, the rollers. But uh, a bigger guy can get in there than it looks. Okay. Then there's hope for me yet. Yeah, oh yeah, you have no problem. <laughs> Well, as as you you know as you're doing flights uh, around the, around the country, what just give us a little briefing on on how you prepare someone 
uh, for a Mustang experience, if especially someone who's maybe not been in a high performance uh, aircraft before, uh, how do you prepare them for what they're going to experience? Well, as you can imagine, with all the rides we give, we've seen just about everything. And the one, the one person that is the most challenging is they're so is the person that is so excited that you tell them something and they say yeah and they haven't heard a word you said and and I and when I ask them I said what did I just say you know you have to you have to figure that out because they've got to know this data to get out of the airplane if we have an emergency and uh, and they'll and they'll start saying well you you this I said no that's not what I said and or and then you have the other guys just starts telling me what you're going to do I says have you flown a Mustang before? I just, you know, I make light of it, but I said, have you flown a Mustang before? But uh, that is that is the biggest challenge. And then you got to tell them, you know, hey, watch out for other airplanes. This is the way we're going to bail out of this airplane if we have a problem. And the two emergencies we, we will have is either engine failure. We've got one engine. If it fails, we got to deal with it. And or if we have a flight control failure or a fire I can't put out, we got to come out. And this is the way we come out. So we have to brief that every passenger. So, um, but I try my best to put them at ease. And if, if you do it lightly and jokingly, you can usually get them to come around and start listening, you know. And, uh, and then there's guys you can tell and man, they, they've got it down pat, you know, it's just, you've got to adjust to the person. And when you're, and you do bring up a, a very good point. I mean, this is uh, an, an old airplane and yep. things can happen on a new or an old airplane. And, and right. really the safety briefing is, is paramount. Um, but there's also the, the, the thrill of, of, of flying that in that Mustang and, and hearing that uh, the hearing that engine spool up for the very first time and, and roll yeah. down the runway uh, yeah. and uh, I, I can only imagine uh, do you have a do you have a rear view mirror in in the cockpit yes. so you can see yes. the okay yes. so I, I suppose on on takeoff for for most uh, for most riders all you see is teeth back there and the big smile <laughs> yeah most of the time and there there are people that are nervous that they're just sitting there kind of checking stuff out you know like I say you get the whole gambit and there's I I will never forget this one lady I took for a ride down Kansas City. This was back when we could still do acrobatics on 6802 rides. And she was so excited. And and from the minute I put the throttle up, she was screaming and hollering and yeah, yeah. And I could hear that lady hollering, hooping and hollering when we did a loop over the sound of that engine. I said, she is she is excited, man. So, I mean, stuff like that, you just can't describe how much fun it is to to share with somebody, you know. Um, and and that, after all the work of doing this, that is the, the payoff for all the work is how much people appreciate and enjoy the ride and the experience. Um, it means a lot to most people. I mean, you're always going to have some that dad bought the ride and it doesn't mean that much, but for the most part, they're spending their hard-earned money to go fly in this piece of history, and it's fun. It certainly is. And it's, now it probably doesn't happen as often as it did maybe 10 years ago, but uh, you uh, obviously have had some World War II veterans fly with you as well. I have. I don't know how many, but several. And uh, one of my favorite guys was uh, Steve Annion down in New Orleans little bitty short guy and uh, he was 91 and I've had 60 year old guys have a lot more trouble than him he popped up on that wing and in there he went and uh, he was ready to go he listened to the brief like he should and everything and um, as soon as we got airborne I says hey Steve you want to try a roll he goes yes sir so we did one to the left I says how about another yes sir he loved it couldn't, couldn't bother him at all. So it's 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 really fun to do that kind of thing. And I had another guy up in um, Oshkosh. His name was Jesse Bell. I'll never forget his name. Jesse Bell. He was an infantry man for uh, in the Battle of the Bulge. And 
someone, uh, I think it was the late uh, Cowden Ward that was offering these guys rides and he didn't have time to give him a ride. And, uh, and I heard about it and I says, come on, let's go. So I took him for a ride and he, he loved it and his family was, was really appreciative of it as well. So, but it's, it's quite the experience. And we see a, a shot here of you, uh, is that you or is that, is that Jeff? That's Jeff. That's Jeff. Tell us a Don't little you? bit about a, a couple of, I mean, you've flown the airplane, uh, you know, solo or solo operator, I guess, for a number yeah. of years, but you've, you've kind of brought a couple of uh, young folks in uh, to yeah. help you out. Yes. Jeff came on with me uh, two years after I took control of the airplane uh, in 09. And he's been, he's been along ever since. Good bud, good friend, good compadre, a good pilot. And, uh, and we, uh, we don't let each other get by with too much. We see the others doing something, we're, we're on each other like stink, but, uh, and that's what we need from each other. You know, uh, we're, we're kind of like brothers. Um, and the next guy after Jeff, we brought two guys, uh, um, actually in the same year, uh, rifle Joe Shatterly, uh, is the next guy in line. He's a currently a, an A-10 pilot in the, in the Missouri, uh, reserves and um, flies for Delta as well. And Pete Scholl, who is a, an ex-Air Force pilot, uh, F-16 guy, he's the captain for Southwest down in Phoenix. So, and the newest addition that I'm gonna to announce tonight, and a lot of people won't know, is Jordan Brown, our new uh, chief of staff, he's gonna start flying the airplane this next year. So, I'm trying to get it all set up so I can walk away and say, you boys be careful, but have a great time. <laughs> It's it's interesting you mentioned uh, Jeff and uh, you and 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 Jeff and your relationship that that is uh, something that uh, pilots need and that well, is absolutely. someone else looking after you and you looking after them. I, I know in the in the in the air show in the aerobatic world there are a lot of the the top performers who help mentor uh, younger performers, but they also peer to peer. Uh, keep an eye on each other, like I'm sure you and Jeff do. And when you see something that's not quite right or something you're not sure about, you, not necessarily calling them out in a bad way, but you bring it up just to make sure everybody remains on the safe side. Absolutely. And and we have that agreement. Hey, I'm not going to take offense if you say something that, that I did something wrong. I mean, I'm going to thank you for it. And we have that agreement. And in fact, that's, that's the agreement with our whole crew. We have that agreement, you know. And you're gonna you're gonna take it with a good uh, attitude, or you won't be part of the team. That's simple as that. And that's the only just, way we can operate. And there's none of us that don't make mistakes. None of us. Yeah. And if it's a mistake, it's a mistake. If it's something intentional, we want to talk about it. Right. I mean? And if it's an attitude issue or something like that, so. Very important point. Uh, I, I know that uh, you do go to air shows uh, quite a bit, but most of the the touring that uh, Gunfighter does is with the uh, Air Power History Tour, and that of course features uh, Fifi, the B twenty nine, and the the B twenty four Diamond Lil. Mm -hmm. um, that's correct. Um, this was a, a great great shot here that uh, Phil McKenna did down in Midland, Texas, several several years ago, and. Um, it was it was a difficult shot to get because you're talking about two majorly different air, uh, airframes, but with him flying off of me was especially a challenge for him because I can I can move my speed a lot easier than he can, but it was a great great uh, photo mission, and um, we are very fortunate that we're part of the the Air Power Tour because it really helps us fund the airplane and. and keep it in tip top shape it is it's a lot of work i'm not going to deny that we worked harder this last year than we've worked any year we did i think it was 221 rides in the mustang and uh but all four of us pulled our loads i mean because i was ret the retired guy i pulled a little bit more than i wanted to but uh we're going to scale back a little this year and and, and try to not to make it quite so crazy so how did you get involved with the tour itself? Uh, man, I have to think about that. Um, 
I'm pretty sure, as I think back, uh, Jonathan Oliver at the time was running the uh, the uh, the tour, and he approached uh, us about being part of the tour, you know, and and just doing when we when we could be there, come and you know, no strings attached. If you if you can make this stop, great. We just coordinate which which ones we could, and it really works <clears throat> for them and for us because when we come along, we attract people that will also take a Fifi ride or a Lil ride. And when they come, they bring us people that, hey, I want to go for riding a Mustang since it's here, you know. So we really complement each other in that regard. It's it's almost uh, back to the old barnstorming days, and uh, exactly. it, when it, it, the uh, you know the impetus of the of the tour itself was to try to bring uh, more than just one airplane to a tour stop. Uh, I, I think Jonathan said you know the more the more props we have, the better the attendance is. Yep. And uh, through the years, it's kind of uh, evolved, and you have everything from some of the smaller trainers, which are more affordable uh, aircraft to fly in if you'd like that living history experience, all the way up to the Mustang, Fifi, or Diamond Lil, or, or sometimes even the B-17s go out uh, with them. Uh, and it, it really has taken on a life of its own and, and has been able to uh, spread the, the CAF and World War II message to uh, more people than would have necessarily seen him uh, at an air show. I agree. Um, we've we've had great exposure to the public through this program and uh, very, very much uh, success on everybody's behalf. So where are some of the uh, the spots that you're going to uh, stop at this year? Get, you, get your pen and paper ready, everybody. Get my cheat list, cheat list <laughs> out here. Uh, our first stop is in Huntsville, Alabama, and it's gonna be the last weekend of April. And we're going to go from there to Columbus, Georgia. Uh, the next weekend in Daytona Beach, Florida. The next weekend after that, Savannah, Georgia. And then Augusta, Georgia. And then we're going to come back home, uh, do some maintenance, uh, make sure everything's good, and go back out with them uh, in June 15th, begin in Dayton, Ohio. And then Cincinnati. And then Fort Wayne, Terre Haute and South Chicago uh, Lewis University, and then come back, do a little bit more maintenance, uh, go to Dubuque, do the formation clinic, go to Oshkosh from there, do a couple of days of rides in Appleton, spend the whole week at Oshkosh, come back, and then rejoin the tour uh, in August, um, going to Alpena, Saginaw, Toledo, um, Mansfield, Ohio, I think, and then Niagara. And that's as far as we've planned. We, we're working on other stops, but that's about all we've got planned so far. We do have a, we've got a bid out for a, um, an air show at Altus Air Force Base the first weekend of October. That's what we have so far. Of course, we'll be at, at Wings Over Dallas way late in the year this year. And right. like, like the 11th or November or something like that, I think. So. Yeah, it's the, uh, uh... 11th, 12th, and 13th, it's uh, right at, at Veterans Day. Uh, yeah. yeah, because of the way the air show schedules for some of the other uh, CAF shows have fallen this year, um, it's one of those years where everything shifts by a week. Uh, gotcha. So we were, we, the Wings Over Dallas show was going to conflict with the, I believe, the Fort Worth uh, air show. Uh, gotcha. So Wings Over Dallas is appropriately on, on Veterans Day because that's, gotcha. you know, the, the, the big focus of that, the, that show is World War II and, and uh, saluting our veterans. Gotcha. Okay. And, if uh, if people want to uh, kind of keep up with where you are, the uh, Air Power History Tour, they they have all the complete dates of, of where you're going, right? Yes, they do, and that's not solidified yet. As I said, we keep it up on our website as well. I kind of put that uh, burden on Jeff uh, on uh, www.p51gunfighter.com, but uh, those both are interchangeable. I mean, you can get to, from one website to the other and uh, see the schedules and we update it as changes come along as well. You mentioned uh, a maintenance, and uh, in that uh, with that airplane, you've got a, a hundred hour inspection that you need to do every one hundred hours. How many hours did you put on the on the airplane last year? We put on a hundred and almost thirty hours, so we had to do a hundred hour this year. 
We haven't had to do that every year, but twice now we've had to do 100 hours. And um, that's a good and a bad thing, you know. <laughs> you got to stop and say, hey, guys, we're out till we get this inspection done. So, uh, but, you know, that's part of the deal. Well, and it, it's also good to catch any minor Absolutely. sort of things that are, are going on with the airplane before they become uh, major problems. Absolutely. That's, it's, it's, it's doing what it's designed to do. That's right. Catch, catch the things that we, we, we don't know is going on. And just uh, uh, briefly, uh, you are also, uh, aside from flying gunfighter and being very involved with the uh, commemorative Air Force, you're also the president of uh, NATA, which is the North American Trainer Association. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, we are one of the, we're actually the largest signatory of uh, FAST, Formation of Safety Training, which is nothing but the liaison between the FAA and the formation community. Um, back in the 90s, the FAA just let everybody know, hey, guys, you're going to have to start policing yourself a little better or we're going to do it and you're not going to like it. So the guys got together, I think, I'm thinking it was like 93 at, at NWOC and started working on this, uh, the, the FAST signature and uh, the operation. And the CAF was part of the first signatory, the, the Trayron, and NADA was part of the uh, the original group. And they got together and they set up standards and ways of doing things. So uh, once you got a certification using those procedures, you were issued a credential, which is nothing but a, a formation card that is good for one year. And uh, that's what you had to have to fly in wavered airspace. You don't need a card to go out and fly formation with your buds on Saturday. That's not required. But you, you must have a formation card credential to fly in airspace or wavered airspace. So uh, just to clarify that, uh, for those who aren't quite familiar with it, when you see a large formation or even a small formation of uh, aircraft, maybe two fighters or a flight of four or even more than that, each one of those uh, pilots has to be qualified and uh, have a, a form, what's called a formation card uh, so that they can uh, safely fly in, uh, in an air show airspace. That is correct. It's just, like, it's just like an extension of your pilot's license to do those maneuvers at the show. And uh, NATA covers a number of, of different aircraft, not just North American P-51s and, and uh, T-6s, correct? T-6s, P-51s, and the, the bombers, the B-25, which, you know, let's face it, to get a, uh, a bunch of bombers together is very expensive, but there are guys in the industry that fly formation very good and uh, do fly the, the, uh, the B-25s in beautiful formations. And also in the Mustangs, they're very expensive to get together. And that's why we take advantage when we have a chance to get together at uh, these major air shows, especially Oshkosh. You never get that many Mustangs or fighters together uh, where you can fly, you know, that much formation, you know, and get really proficient. And you get the differential uh, 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 aircraft, you know, and Dissimilar is what the, is the way they use the term, um, and it's it's different. But you know, once you've done it a lot, it's just it's just a gas. I mean, I it, it, there's no not, not much more fun than flying acrobatics and or flying formation, you know, in airplanes. It's it's just it's a real hard challenge to learn it, but once you do it, it is a gas. Well, let's take a look uh, in the uh, the few minutes we have remaining here of, of some of the, the questions that have come in. I've, I've tried to interject them into the into the uh, presentation as we've been going along, but I uh, didn't get to all of them. Um, uh, what's your favorite movie featuring a Mustang and why? Hmm. <laughs> I can't. That's a hard question. Um I, I can uh, you think about it I'll I'll jump in on this one because okay. uh, this is the movie that that gave me my my love and, and passion for for the Mustang and that is a movie called Battle Him which was uh, about the Korean conflict yeah. and uh, I, I went to Catholic grade school and 
I forget the the, uh, the lead character's name, but he was a, a P-51 or an F-51 pilot in, in Korea at that time and ended up uh, inadvertently bombing near, I, I think, an orphanage. And, and there were a lot of civilians that were injured and killed. And the, the moral of the story was he had taken that experience and, and become uh, a missionary. Uh, Unfortunately, I took that experience as in that airplane is really cool, and I want to know more about it. <laughs> so, so that one know, is is the one for my uh, for for me, and that that was really uh, my start in in uh, a Warbird uh, airplane. So, uh, gave you time to think about it, Larry. Did you come well, up with anything? I, I don't. I honestly do not have a particular movie that. I mean, let's face it. The in. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, when the Mustangs come in and start strafing right there, at, you know, when they're 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 uh, at the bridge, that was pretty darn cool. I don't care what anybody says, but um, I don't have a particular movie, and, and frankly, uh, that that I think, you know, is is one over the other. Every time I see that airplane in anything, you know, it does it for me. So, and, and then that's the honest truth. There we go. Um, you've met a lot of uh, pilots uh, in your in your day. Um, any of them that that stick out as as uh, ones that you uh, particularly admire? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> who cannot admire Bob Hoover? I mean, the consummate gentleman, the um, the ultimate pilot. Uh, gosh, he could fly an airplane like no one. I mean. He in, in me he's the he's the apex in my opinion Bob Hoover and to have personally met him and sit and visit with him was a privilege and an honor um, and he he is actually he actually flew gunfire uh, yeah I got a picture of him taxing in in gunfire and uh, so that mean that's kind of special too um, there's a lot of guys that you know Reggie flew the hell out of the airplane believe me he. He could fly it very well and uh, flew it for so many years. Um, unfortunately, the late Dale Snort, Snort, uh, Snodgrass, crazy man. I, I mean, I say that respectfully because, God, he was a hell of a stick. And I watched him fly on the Mustang, and, um, you know, he was pretty hot pilot, let's say, let's face it. Um, and... Um, that's, that's probably the two people I would say that I really respect what they've done in the airplane. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of people that fly and look, look what Steve Hinton does for Christ's yeah. sake. He flies everything and, you know, flies it superb. And so does his son right. and, uh, and just wonderful people down to earth that you can talk to. I, I respect them all. Yeah. Uh, Let's see, uh, how many hours do you have in the Mustang? Uh, somewhere around 1,550 hours, I think it is. Do you have any idea how that compares to other uh, P-51 pilots? I honestly do not. Yep. I honestly do not. I know Lee Lauderback's well in excess of 10,000 hours, and, <laughs> and you know, uh, that's someone else that flies the airplane, yeah. you know, so well. And I, I went and trained with Lee. Uh, he's he's Mr. Mustang. Let's face it. And uh, Lee Lauterbach uh, has the uh, the twin um, twin the two seat Mustang, which is actually the TF uh, fifty one uh, trainer down in in uh, Kissimmee, Florida. Correct. Correct. And that that airplane was specifically built as a as a two seat trainer. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, now the one I think was a converted one. Uh, but they're completely converted exactly like the Timco built them. And Timco didn't build too many of them. It's down in Dallas. But that was right at the end of the war, I think, when they built them. Yeah, for the most part, uh, those who checked out in the, the P-51, like you, got rung out in the T-6 first before they, they sat in the, even sat in the cockpit of the P-51. Right. And then um, pretty much your, your first flight was uh, your introduction to the, the transition. Yeah, I was fortunate that um, I got to fly in a two-seater, or at least two controls. It was one of those that had a mod in it that had the, the throttle, the stick, and the pedals in the back. 
and a gentleman named Harry Barr in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, put me in the front seat and said, you know, let's go fly. I said, well, Harry, I haven't even read the book. He said, don't matter. He said, you've been flying a T6. This thing's going to be a lot easier than a T6. And he's right. Once you've got almost 200 hours in a T6, you're ready to fly a Mustang. You just need to know the systems and the, the gotchas, and you're ready to go. There you go. Finally, uh, what's the best advice someone has ever given you? Hmm. Um, I would say, and, and it's my advice to pass on, is whatever you do in life and in flying, is always keep your attitude in check. Because if you get so full of yourself, you can and very easily kill yourself and someone else along with you. Um, I've, I've been fortunate in my uh, 28,000 plus hours. I've had some incidents, uh, but I haven't been hurt. And um, I try to, to accept the fact that things can happen to me. And, and I, know, I know they are, they can. And I have to fly like that, with that attitude. And I have to treat other people like I want to be treated and uh, respect them the way I want to be respected. That sounds good. We appreciate your time tonight. And uh, thank you to everyone for uh, joining us. Again, don't forget to click the uh, like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about any future shows. And uh, if you have any ideas of uh, folks like Larry you'd like to uh, hear from or aircraft you'd like us to profile, just drop Leah Block a note at media at cafhq.org. Thanks again to our guest, Larry Lumpkin. Larry, uh, enjoy the uh, warmth down in Florida, and uh, we'll see you out on the air show circuit uh, this year. You bet. Thanks for having me. All right. Until next time, for the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night.